So if you ever want, I'm just going to say it's a C for this. So I can even see my screen here. Um, well, my, my name is Adam Silcott, um, and I work for a company uh, called Mapteca as an Unity developer. Um, I, for the past eight years, I've been doing um, basically interactive data visualizations funded by NASA using NASA's Earth Science Data. Um, and, uh, hey, yeah. Since we're recording with you and we want you, can you switch over and let us see? Sure. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I started at Napteca, they were looking for someone uh, who could do uh, some uh, data visualizations in VR, and VR and uh, Unity is uh, the top uh, platform for VR development. Um, uh, it was then, I think it still is today. Um, and uh, so uh, I, uh, I did that. Um, and what we would do at the time, uh, for a long time, was make these, uh, uh, take, work with the various earth science uh, departments in NASA, take their data, make a cool, fun, like interactive visualization with it, take it to conferences and conventions. And uh, the scientists loved it because their people are engaging with their data. Um, but, um, uh, and then COVID hit and the conferences all stopped and um, that's, that was fine because uh, we were really starting to move into how can we use this uh, technology to help people um, uh, uh, decision makers and stakeholders um, understand the data better. Um, and so uh, we've, since then we've been working on, um, well, I won't uh, actually, this was something that we were doing for uh, before for the conferences. This was a, a basically data has this uh, uh, NASA has this uh, uh, global precipitation model satellite um, that does these really cool 3D uh, volumetric uh, measurements of precipitation, and they when it crossed over the path of um, Hurricane Matthew, um, they got this really cool uh, um, data about that. And uh, they, of course, use their supercomputers to render out this cool, slick animation of this data and they'll use some data points. And so they're like, can you do that in VR? And I'm like, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're taking something that was rendered on a super, supercomputer and trying to render it in real time on a commercial GPU, uh, you know, or whatever it was at the time, you could get something. Um, and uh, I wasn't sure, but, uh, but it worked out. And, um, it was a it was a fun uh, project. Uh, let's see. Uh, there it is. There's the Hurricane Matthew, and that's where the path of the satellite crossed Hurricane Matthew. We got that precipitation data, as you can walk around inside the data and sort of slice into it and see see the interior. Um, so that was one of the many projects that we've done. We've done so many different projects. We've done flooding projects uh, where we're showing. Uh, we take a we take like Puerto Rico as well as um, Norfolk, Virginia, and um, modeled that area and um, shown what it would look like with this you know amount of a storm a storm surge uh, rise versus sea level rise and things like that. Um, also, San Diego, we were doing conferences, and I, I don't think I have that video on here. We were doing conferences in, um, at the Laser User Conference in San Diego, and we showed what it would look like with uh, what that conference center would look like with five feet of you know, sea level rise. Or whatever. Um, lately, since we've uh, shifted away from doing the conferences, we've started to do doing, um, we've been working with the Wildfire um, pro program. And um, we're, so this is a visualization of uh, the um, Hermit's Peak wildfire um, at, uh, in, North, in New Mexico, um, which was uh, probably heard of this really big um, uh, wildfire. The, uh, off to the right, you can see um, at a certain point, you can see um, Las Vegas. Um, and, uh, so this is something that we're hoping can be used as a tool for training um, or fire management 
part of my finger. And this is actually an earlier version of that, but uh, this is uh, the same same fire, but with um, the daylight cycle and lighting up the clouds. Um, it's a it's a bit of a relief not having to do this in VR um, because VR is very very limiting. It's kind of freed me up a little bit to, um, you know, as fun as VR is, it's very challenging. Um, so yeah, um, how did that all start? Uh, well, actually, it started with the uh, the game jam that um, uh, um, Julia. Julia <laughs> sorry, uh, the Julia mentioned. Um, I came here, and I think it was 2014, um, and I had been. I, I've been programming game, video games since I was nine years old, uh, but I never, uh, you know, I had only been picked up UVG a couple of, a year or so earlier, and I had no idea what to expect. I figured I'd be coming in and just kind of be blown away by all of these you know, developers. Um, and it turned out I had nothing to worry about. People, all, all sorts of skill level, all sorts of people, people who've never even made a game, never, never even programmed, they're just there for Lighting and music and art. Um, it was an incredibly cool environment. Um, and uh, even though the game that we made for it uh, barely worked, um, we made like one half finished level for it. Uh, it was such a great experience. It got me really excited about the you know, small game development community in Frederick. Um, and so uh, that was the, the Global Game Jam. The cool thing about the Global Game Jam is that it's, it, they're designed to be in person. A lot of the other big game jams like the Ujare, you can call it Ujare or the Ujare, it's pronounced either way. Um, those are tend, tend to be um, more uh, focused on um, groups of people or, or individuals or groups of people that just get together and do their own thing. Um, that, uh, whereas the Global Game Jam is sort of the, about the event space, so you go to your events and you have a lot of other people around you making projects and you can team up with them. Um, so uh, since then, um, uh, I started uh, meeting with this group of people. Um, a friend of mine, or someone, someone in Frederick, started uh, the uh, Frederick Game Dev Meetup, and I started coming to that. At a certain point, he stepped down as the organizer and asked if I wanted to take it over. And then we started doing. Um, at one point, we were doing like three game jams a year in this location. Um, and uh, they were they're just a really awesome space to uh, meet other people who had similar interests um, and uh, work together or, or separately on things in a kind of like an exciting environment. Um, if, as every, if you aren't familiar with Game Jams, they're um, they, they usually, they're, it's either, it's an event, often a competition, which invites people to make a game in a fixed amount of time. Um, and the idea is that the um, game development is really hard, uh, but by setting a limited amount of time, it forces you to, to make small, simple games. Um, and that's, that's really fun uh, because the small, simple games are, it's a, it's a chance to uh, learn and uh, get uh, develop more of a community because uh, the, the stakes are low um, and um, small simple games are easier to get feedback on because you can you can get more people playing the games and and um, and uh, you know, get some feedback on it which helps you to learn. Um, so uh, yeah we hosted a number of these here um, I mean, during COVID we kind of dropped off but then this past year we did a, we did a really very successful one. Um, there's a couple of people working away on the game. Um, this is uh, my friend Greg uh, giving a demonstration, just sort of during a break, on how to model things in Blender. Um, so lots of opportunities for people to learn things and share share their knowledge and experience. Um, and um, uh, speaking of Greg, uh, you know, I met Greg through a game, uh, game uh, through this game jam community, and Melanie here. 
uh, these two goofballs, and they are <laughs> going to become my best friend. Um, I also met my wife um, through this um, um, through this uh, activity, and uh, I, I also got my job through this. Actually, someone who was at one of the early game jams I went to um, said that he had a, uh, a relative who was looking for a new game developer, and I, um, I was ready for a change in um, in a career path, and I. I thought that's kind of exciting, so I want to talk with him, and that's how I got the job that I have today. Um, so uh, even though I'm not making games, um, I'm still working. In, in some ways, it's nice because I've heard so many horror stories about the, the, the environment of working in kids' studios, um, crunch time, and uh, the uh, uh, challenging work conditions. Um, there's pros and cons to doing the kinds of things I do. I'm not actually making games, but they are, uh, many of them feel meaningful because I'm working with real, real world data and trying to affect real change in the world. Um, it's uh, very challenging. You know, I, try to, I have to explain to people all the time that running something in real time is much harder than running it in you know, pre rendering it on the supercomputer. Um, you know, you're usually looking at huge amounts of data. And so uh, a lot of the same tricks that, uh, that big uh, studios use to get a lot of uh, data effects into a game. I mean, game, uh, making games is a lot about uh, trickery, uh, visual trickery. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're fooling people into thinking that there's an entire forest of trees there when you really only a portion of them are rendered at any time. Um, so uh, a lot of the same tricks that go into making these big games have to go into making these, um, these uh, um, simulations because um, we're working with so much data. Um, so yeah, uh, led to my job. Um, so in what I've been doing is you know working on professionally with Unity, um, but also just taking uh, continuing to do game jams and sort of having Unity as, as a, a hobby as well. Um, which is nice because there's some synergy between them. Um, the things I learned through these game jams, I can apply to my work, things I learned through work, I can apply to game jams. Uh, are unfortunately, uh, so these, uh, with these two, uh, we kind of clicked and had a lot of fun making some games. Um, our website is down right now, but our itch page is up. And these are a few of the older games that we made. I'll just show a few of these real quick. I don't know if all of is on or not. This was a game where you you play as the that's really loud. <laughs> um, let's try to turn that down some. Uh, this is a game where you play as the product plants trying to eat the Mario's. This was a very early game jam. <laughs> um, this was a game where you are a puffer fish trying to escape from a sushi restaurant using, <laughs> using the one skill that you have, which is to inflate and deflate strategically. So, this one, after our amazing artist joined us, we did this one where you play as a, an old Game Boy or Game, I forget what you call it, Game Boy that gets abandoned. Has to uh, go on a, a little adventure to uh, restore its, its confidence in itself, and basically uh, go around and engage in uh, Pokemon-style battles, dialogue battles with, um, with more modern, newer technology, um, which tries, to, which all tries to make you feel bad. Um, for being so old and obsolete. The theme, the theme of the contest was obsolete. This, um, all of these have uh, themes. Um, I forget what the theme for this one was, but we, we decided to make a, a darker, creepier, sort of moody uh, um, a game about where you're a little girl lost in the woods. And this one actually won us, uh, we got fourth place in mood and audio and made the top 20 overall, which was pretty good for, because these usually have like top three thousand entries. Um, so yeah, that's some of the games that we made, um, and uh, that's uh, some of the links to the Frederick Games Discord. Um, 
if anyone wants me to just actually just like send you a an invite, I could if that's easier than writing about all these letters, that's fine. Um, the Global Game Jam, uh, we'll probably continue doing them here, so which will be announced on our Discord. Uh, they usually they usually around the beginning of the year in January. Uh, Ludendare used to be three times a year, I think it's twice a year now. That's a really cool game jam because you, um, after the game jam is over, you you get more visibility. You put it on your, your project page. You get more visibility for your game by reviewing other people's games. And so there's a real incentive to go and play other people's games and give them feedback on it. All of that earns you sort of karma when it comes to your own games. And so that is just a, such a fantastic, it creates such a fantastic sort of like, uh, you know, a lot of these game jams, you do it, you upload it, you're done, you go on with your life. You don't really know if anyone played it or not. But with the Ludogare, you know it, you know that people are playing, you know like, how they felt about it, and, and uh, so that's great. There's another one that's become very popular, which is uh, the Game Maker's Toolkit Team Jam, uh, which is um, started by um, a guy who, who does the Game, uh, game Maker <laughs> Toolkit. Uh, YouTube videos, which are very popular videos about game design. Uh, you can find tons of game jams on itch, itch, uh, itch.io's uh, jams page. And then um, I didn't put a link to our website right now, but the, you can find a link to our own itch uh, page for the little games that we make. Um, so yeah, that's um, kind of, that's, that's it for my talk. I wanted to leave a lot of time for Questions and discussion. So, how many of you, you might have said it at the beginning, but how many of you have ever developed a game? How many of you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah? 